happy weekend and good morning, Prairie Lakes Church. How are we? We're good. That's awesome. Beautiful, beautiful day, beautiful weekend to celebrate all that God is doing in us and through us. And we get to worship Jesus together at Prairie Lakes Church. It was an awesome, awesome thing. So let's start the way we always do. Grab a Bible, grab your phone or tablet if you prefer. There should be a Bible under seat somewhere near you if you don't have one. Uh, grab a pen, and if you don't have a pen, raise your hand right now, and ushers are coming down. Make sure you get a pen this weekend, because at the end of the service, we're going to walk through an experience with this postcard together. So you're going to need a postcard and a pen. And so ushers have pens, so raise your hand. They'll throw one at you. That's yours to keep and to write with, and you can take notes on the back of your bulletin. We'd love if you do that this weekend. And hey, uh, while we do all that and get all that stuff situated, we are one church on many corners. And at Prairie Lakes Church, it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done or what's been done to you. You can look for God in this place. This can be your church home, and we're excited about that, and we mean that. So we're really glad that you're here. But we're one church on many corners. We have six campuses spread all across Iowa. We have hundreds of people that watch every single weekend online. In fact, this weekend, probably a lot of people are in a, in a camper, RV, tent, or on your way there. And so we're really excited about that. But we get to celebrate stuff all the time at Prairie Lakes Church because we have so many campuses. And one of the cool things that happened this week that we get to celebrate is our Osage campus bought land to build their brand new building. Praise God. And we're going to show you a, a picture of the Osage staff now, color coordinated. And if you didn't know this, the Osage staff is outstanding in their field. You're welcome. I'll be here all morning. I'll be here all morning. Um, but we're really excited about Osage and what God's doing all through that campus. And God's doing some awesome stuff. So thanks for your generosity. Thanks for what you do because it makes a difference, not just in the Cedar Valley, but all across Iowa in what God's doing. And uh, this weekend, uh, we were approached recently by a church in Cedar Rapids that said, hey, what would it look like to maybe partner with us and maybe have a PLC campus in, in Cedar Rapids? And so if you're watching online from Cedar Rapids or if you've got family or friends in that area that might be interested in Prairie Lakes Church, here's what I want you to do. Email Pastor John. It's john.fuller at prairielakeschurch.org and just say, hey, here's who I am or here's a contact of somebody you might want to get in touch with because we're just exploring what God might be doing if we were to launch a campus down there in Cedar Rapids. So that's another thing to be aware of and, and just have on your radar and to be praying about for us as a church. All right, this is the last week of a five-week series called Wish You Were Here. And we've been looking at how to move our relationships from where they are to where we wish they would be. And the series is really important because we know that God wants us to reach Iowa. Our goal as a church is to make it impossible to get to hell from Iowa. And to do that, we're going to have to do that one person at a time, one relationship at a time. And God's put all of us in different circles of influence, whether it be at home or at school, in our neighborhoods, at work, so that we might connect with people and connect people to Jesus. That's, that's our goal. And if our relationships are messy and out of control, it's going to be really hard to connect with people. And it's going to be hard to connect people to Jesus. And so we're looking at how Jesus did relationships. And we're looking at how we can move our relationships forward. And so far, we've looked at big issues like forgiveness and communication and how to set boundaries in relationships and how to have those crucial, difficult conversations with people. And this weekend, we're going to look at this issue of blind spots, of blind spots. Things in our lives that we're not aware of but that we do and how that impacts our relationships. So we're going to ask questions, what are blind spots? How do we know where they are in our lives? What did Jesus say to people who had blind spots? And how do we get rid of them? How do we become aware of things in our lives that we're not currently aware of? And this topic is so important because we all have blind spots. We all have things in our lives that we're not aware of. But here's the problem. Everybody else is aware of your blind spots. They're like a neon sign above your head. You know that annoying guy at work. There's the neon sign. Everybody sees it but him. Your spouse has blind spots and you see them. The problem is you've got a neon sign above your head too that says here's what I'm doing and here's who I am. And oftentimes we're not aware of them. And if you've ever driven a car, if you're 15 or older, you've probably driven a car, you know about blind spots. They're those spots in the rear of the car that you can't see. And if you're not careful, you're going to run people into the ditch. And teenagers, if you're not careful, you're going to raise your parents' insurance rates like crazy if you're not careful with those blind spots. And the same thing is true in our relationships. If we're not aware of what we're not aware of, we can run our relationships into the ditch, whether it's friendships or marriage or a parenting or relationships at work. If we don't become aware of what we aren't aware of, we can't work on things in our lives. And so this weekend, we're going to dig into this idea of what are the things that control us and influence our relationships that we're not aware of. And so uh, we're going to start with the definition of blind spot. So I want you to write this down. Here's what a blind spot is. A blind spot is parts of our character, parts of our relationships, beliefs, or actions that we can't see. 
The parts of our character, relationships, actions, or beliefs that we can't see. Things we just aren't aware of. Things in our lives that we do all the time that impact our relationships that we aren't aware of. Now, we know about funny blind spots, don't we? Uh, every time I come on stage, I check my fly because I don't want to be that guy that comes up on stage and has the barn door open. And it's one of my greatest fears. But we all know someone who's stood up on stage and had that. Ex- or we know about people that have bad breath. And everybody knows it but them. And they've got the onion garlic thing going on and like the whole force field of breath. And everyone's just like, when they're talking to that person. <laughs> but they don't know. It's like they could knock flies off a camel with that breath. And, but they don't know. They're completely unaware. I was at Wells Fargo Bank in Nebraska last weekend. I was visiting family. And the, the teller at Wells Fargo, he looked awesome. I mean, for a teller, he was rocking it. He had a press shirt. He had a bow tie, a big old bushy beard. And I was like, this guy, like, I want to talk to this guy. So there's a, a guy in front of me in line, and he leaves. And I'm getting ready to compliment this teller on his appearance because he's looking just awesome. And he looks up with his big bushy beard, and he had white crap all over the side of his beard. Just like a big old streak of it. And I went from going, hey, I'm going to compliment this guy, to going toothpaste or glazed donut. What, what does he have all over the side of his? And he had no clue. And so guess what I did? I didn't say a word. <laughs> I walked out and I was just like, I hope somebody tells that guy that he's got this white stuff all over. But obviously nobody had. Everybody around him knew, but this poor guy doesn't know that he's got toothpaste or whatever all over his face. Blind spots are like, where they can be funny and comical, but a lot of times, listen, blind spots in our relationships are really hard and painful and destructive. See, we can laugh about some of those blind spots, but oftentimes blind spots in our lives and in our character look like this. We assume the worst in people around us, or we're really judgmental, and we don't know it. We're bitter, we're sarcastic, we're edgy around certain people or certain topics, and we're not aware that we are. Or we have poor physical boundaries with people, especially people of the opposite sex, and we make people uncomfortable, and we're not aware that we're doing it. Or how about this one? The the person that always has to one-up somebody else's story. If you caught an 18-inch bass, they caught a 20-inch bass. If you work 40 hours this week, they work 60 hours this week. And everybody around them is like, oh, there's the one-up guy or gal. But they don't know it. Completely oblivious to the fact that they do that over and over and over again. And oftentimes, the greatest pet peeves that we have in other people are blind spots that we have in our lives. Oftentimes, the things that we look at, the other people's neon signs and go, man, that's obvious, are oftentimes the same things in our lives that we're not aware of. And the challenge is this. I know some of you are listening right now and you're going, well, I I don't have any blind spots. And and I'm just glad that I'm self-aware and I'm working on all this stuff that I, I know what I need to work on. And if that's you, you have this massive blind spot in your life already. But here's my challenge this weekend. This is not a comfortable, easy, like happy thing to do when we look at our lives through the lens of of, of Christ. But it's a, a necessary thing to do. So this weekend, as we dig in, my, my encouragement is just to hang with this material and and take some of the next steps we're going to look at and talk about at the end of this message and really choose to dig in. Because if you choose to deny or if you choose to plug your ears, you're going to stay stuck in your relationships where you are now. But if you have the courage to look at your life and your character and your relationships and say, God, what's there? What's really there? You'll have the power to move your relationships forward. Uh, Here's the deal. In life, there are two blinders. There are two things that keep us blind to the things in our lives. Two things that prevent us from seeing. And I'm going to show you an image of a horse. If you've ever seen a horse that has blinders on, uh, you know about what blinders are. They're also called blinkers, which I thought was hilarious. Uh, But they're attached to a bridle or the hood of a, a horse. And these two blinders are on the side of a horse's face so that the horse won't get distracted. So the horse can only see in front of it and can't be aware of what's going on around it. And it's really helpful for a horse. But if we have blinders over our eyes in our life, it prevents us from seeing things that we need to see. Things in our relationships, in our character, things in our heart that we need to be aware of. And here are the two blinders. We're going to go through these one at a time. The two things in our lives that keep us from seeing the things we need to see. The first one is pride. So write this down. Blinder number one in our lives is pride. And pride is self-reliance. Pride is simply self-reliance. And pride is a massive problem in our lives because it blinds us to seeing what we need to see. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride will bring him down, but a man of humble spirit gains honor. Pride doesn't allow advice into our life. It blocks out the voices of other people and says, I don't need to know. I don't really care. 
when we're prideful, we walk around thinking life is amazing and so am I. Pride is often an image thing. It's that I see myself as good apart from Jesus. Pride says, I've got this. I don't need to fix anything. It's taken care of. It's really their problem, not mine. And ultimately the problem with pride is that it makes us unwilling to see things in our lives. We might be vaguely aware that we've got an issue or a problem, but that blinder of pride prevents us from owning it. We become unwilling to acknowledge it and we suppress the truth. We end up denying the truth because this blinder of pride is up in our lives and it prevents us from seeing what we need to see. We're going to look at an example now of how Jesus confronts some people that were struggling with this blinder of pride. So if you would turn your Bibles to John chapter 9. John chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 13. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, John's about 80% of the way through the Bible. It's in the New Testament. The New Testament goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And as you're getting there, I'm going to catch you up to speed in this chapter. So in the first 12 verses, Jesus heals a man who was born blind. He was a man probably in his 20s or 30s who'd never been able to see. And here's what Jesus does. He hawks a loogie in the ground. He makes some mud paste smears it all over the dude's eyes and face and says, go wash in a pool, and he does, and he can see. Now, if you're like me, you're sitting here thinking, um, couldn't you have done that a different way, Jesus? Like, just be like, hey, dude, open your eyes, and you've got sight. Woo! But he makes a loogie paste, puts it all over the dude's face, says wash, and he can see for the first time. Imagine being able to see for the first time in your life faces of your friends, colors, shapes, the, the stuff around you. It's this incredible experience where this man can now see his blindness, his physical blindness is gone, but he's about to be interrogated by the Pharisees. This is the best day of his life. And look what happens in verse 13. This is wild. It says, they brought to the Pharisees the man who'd been born blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Here's what he said. He, Jesus, put mud on my eyes, the man replied. I washed, and now I see. But some of the Pharisees said, but but this man's not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, well, how could a sinner perform such signs? So the Pharisees were divided. You see, the Pharisees had all these rules about the Sabbath day. You could only walk this far. You couldn't do good works. You couldn't heal people. These weren't laws from the Bible. These were rules that they made up on their own, and Jesus was breaking all of them. And they didn't like that. So they didn't want to see, their pride was getting in the way. They didn't want to see who Jesus was or what Jesus had done. And so, look at verse 17. They, they turned again to the blind man. What do you have to say about this Jesus? It was your eyes that he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. They still, not, still did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight. So they sent for the man's parents. This is ridiculous. Verse 19. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one who you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? Verse 20, we know he's our son, they answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can now see or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And that's why his parents said he's of age. Ask him. And then look at verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who'd been born blind. This is what pride does. Pride doesn't allow us to see what's really going on in our relationships or our heart or our life. These Pharisees are so blinded by pride and arrogance that they can't possibly acknowledge that Jesus did this wonderful miracle. So they summon the man, they ask the man, they interrogate him, they bring the man's parents in, and now they brought the man back in again. This poor guy, he's finally able to see, he wants to celebrate with people, and he keeps getting interrogated by the Pharisees. And look what happens in verse 25 or 24. It says, the second time they summon the man, and they say this, give glory to God, which is like them saying, swear on God's name. We know this man is a sinner. Verse 25, he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I can see. They asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be one of his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, Jesus, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw the man out. 
Their pride did not allow them to acknowledge who Jesus was. Their pride did not allow them to see this wonderful miracle that Jesus had done. They were so worried about the rules and the do's and the don'ts that they had created that they were missing Jesus. And they were blind to their own needs. Look at verse 35 as Jesus confronts the Pharisees. It says, Jesus heard that they'd thrown the man out. And when he found the man, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, the man asked. Tell me so that I may believe. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you now. The man said, Lord, I believed, and he worshiped Jesus. And Jesus said, for judgment I've come into the world so that the blind will see and that those who see will become blind. Look at verse 40. Some of the Pharisees who were with Jesus heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim to see, your guilt remains. You see what pride does? Pride puts up this blind that says, I don't want to see what's really there. I don't want to be aware of what I'm not aware of. And I've got my beliefs and I know what I believe and here's the reality. And pride blinds us. And the Pharisees couldn't see their own spiritual need. And Jesus said, because you think you got this. Because of your pride, you're really blind. You're unaware of your need for me. The Savior of the world is standing before you and you're rejecting him. He's doing good works and you're rejecting the miracles that he's doing. And in our own lives, when we have this blinder of pride up, when we can't see, we say things like this. Well, I don't have a drinking problem. I'm in control. I can quit anytime, and it doesn't impact my relationships. We say things like this. I'm not an angry person. I handle my anger just fine. Thank you. We say things like my marriage is fine. My, my kids are okay. I, I don't need you telling me about my life or my kids or my finances. Pride creates this blinder that says I'm okay. I don't need you to tell me anything. Do you have pride in your life right now that's blinding you from things in your heart and in your life and in your relationships? Is pride blinding you from seeing what you need to see? Jesus confronts pride head on in this story. He doesn't skirt around it. He says, here's your problem. And for some of us today, we need to hear that from Jesus. Pride is your thing that's keeping you blind. That's blinder number one. Blinder number two is this. Write this down. Blinder number two is deceit. I before E except after C, deceit. And deceit is being, believing lies about God, ourselves, or others. That's what deceit is. It's believing lies about God, about ourselves, or others. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? You know, we hear from people all the time, just follow your heart. Do what your heart says. Listen, our hearts will lead us into a ditch over and over and over again if we're not careful. We, we as, as humans, no matter if we're saved or not, we are masters at self-deception. We can so easily talk ourselves in or out of things that we should or shouldn't do. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. And being deceived creates a blinder in our lives. Deceit is believing a false idea about God or ourselves or others that causes ignorance, confusion, and helplessness. See, see, pride says I'm not able to see things, but deceit says I am unable to completely see things. P pride says I'm unwilling to go there. Deceit says I'm unwilling to see that. Because here's the thing. If we believe a lie about God, when the truth comes along, we're not going to be able to accept that truth because we're hanging on to this lie. If we're deceived about ourselves and our character and how we actually are, when someone comes along and says, here's what I see in you, we're going to reject it because it doesn't fit with what we believe. If someone comes along and says, it looks like your marriage is in trouble, you say, no, 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 I I'm good. When we're deceived, we can't receive the truth because we're believing the lie and they're incompatible. And when we're deceived, it's a massive blinder in our lives that it doesn't allow us to see what's going on in our heart, in our lives, and in our relationships. Whether that's parenting, whether that's marriage, whether that's work, it doesn't matter. When we believe lies, oftentimes we ruin relationships and we have all these blind spots in our lives that we are not aware of. I want you to turn to Luke 18. So you're in John 9 now. So turn just like 10 pages to the left to Luke 18. And in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 18, Jesus confronts this man called the rich young ruler. And this man, the rich young ruler, is believing two really massive lies about himself and about his life that are derailing his relationships. And I love this story because this man actually seeks out Jesus. He seeks out Jesus. And in Luke 18, 18, here's what the Bible says. It says, a certain ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He asked him the million-dollar question. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one's good except God alone. 
You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. He lays out half the, the Ten Commandments. And look at how he responds in verse 21. The man says, all of these I've kept since I was a boy. And I'm throwing down the bull card on that one. There's no way. Jesus just said, here's half the Ten Commandments. And this guy says, I've never lied. I've never had a lustful thought. I've always obeyed my parents. I've never coveted. I, I'm good. I'm a good person, Jesus. I've got this. I've got it covered. I am self-righteous. I'm holy. I am good. The first lie that this man believed that was blocking his relationship with God is that I can be good on my own. I can be a good person. I can be good enough and do X, Y, and Z, so therefore God will have to accept me. And i got to believe this man approached Jesus thinking he was going to hear from Jesus, hey, you're awesome, you're a rock star. And he doesn't, and all of a sudden the conversation shifts. Now notice how Jesus confronts his deceit. Jesus doesn't yell at the man, he doesn't lose his mind or his temper. Here's what Jesus says in verse 22, because he sees his heart and he sees his sin. It says, when Jesus heard his reply, he said to him, well, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come, follow me. When the man heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. The second lie, the second way this man, this young man was deceived, is he thought all God wants from me is outward obedience. All God wants from me is that I walk the line and do X, Y, and Z. And Jesus said, no, 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 here's the deal. I want your heart. What I want is a relationship with you. Because right now, dude, on, your, on the throne of your heart is your wealth and your possessions. You are defined by what you own and not by what I have done for you. The first lie was, I can be good on my own. The second lie is, all God wants is my actions. And Jesus says, no, I want your heart. And he was completely blind to that because of the lies that he believed. And he missed it. The Bible says he walked away sad because he realized, I've got to choose between my possessions and my wealth or Jesus. I can't have both on the throne of my heart. I can't worship both. I can't run after both first. Jesus has to be first. And he wrestles with this decision. We don't know how it turned out. We don't know if he turned his life around, but this man couldn't see his own need for Jesus. He thought he was gonna hear, well done, good and faithful one. And he heard instead, give everything you have away and worship me first. When we have deceit in our lives as God confronts us. A lot of times we have things in our life like this. When we're deceived, we have deceit in our life and it's a blinder. A lot of times we say things like this. My son, my daughter would never do that. I have talked to enough teachers to know this is one of their biggest pet peeves. When parents come in and say, oh, no, 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 you got it wrong. My daughter would never do that at school. My son would never say something like that. And it's like, oh my if you knew, <laughs> your kids are not always angels. They're sinners that need saving, and they do things wrong. When we're deceived, we say things like this. God simply couldn't love me. I've run too far. I've done too much. I've strayed. I, there's no way God could possibly love me. And when we believe that lie, there are blind spots all over the place in our lives because of that singular lie. Sometimes we, when we're deceived, say things like this. I'll always be this way. I was born this way. I, I'll always struggle with this. I, I can't help it. This is just who I am. Or we'll say things like, they're always out to get me, whoever they are, ex-wife, coworker, boss, friend. They're always out. To, I'm always the victim of other people's stuff. When we're deceived, when we believe these lies, it prevents us from accepting the truth of how things really are. And when we believe lies, it blinds us to what's really going on in our heart and our lives and our relationships. And it runs our relationships into the ditch. Are you deceived right now? Are there truths that you're rejecting because you're believing lies about you or about God or about other people and you're not able to see what's really going on in you? Listen, if we walk around like a horse with blinders on, if we walk around with pride and deceit, we're going to run our relationships into the ditch, whether it's our marriage, our parenting, our work. We're going to find ourselves there over and over and over again and wonder why. It's because we can't see what we need to see. So here's the big question this weekend. How do we become aware of what we're not aware of? How do we cut through pride and deceit and see what's really going on in our lives? And we're going to look at three relationships that we have to have. Three relationships that reveal to us what we're really like and what's really going on. Three relationships that reveal to us blind spots in our lives. And these blind spots, or these relationships rather, are like mirrors. Now mirrors can be good or bad, right? Because mirrors show us an accurate picture of what we look like. 
I was at Kohl's several months ago with my shirt off. I was in a dressing room. Don't worry about that part. I wasn't walking around with my shirt off. I was in the dressing room with my shirt off, and I was trying on some shirts, and that place hides nothing. The lights are bright. The mirrors are everywhere, and I was sitting there looking at myself, and I'm just like, and I almost wanted to go to a different one to see if the mirror was different like next door because I didn't like what I saw. And I'm like, man, I'm getting older. Like the 30s are not kind to me. And I'm like, I need to work out. Like, man. And I looked in the mirror and I was like, I don't like what I see. And I know many of you, if you're over the age of 25, all of you at some point have had this experience where you're looking into a mirror and going, oh. And you're kind of doing one of these. Like maybe this will help. No, that doesn't help either. Like, I don't like what I see in the mirror. And here's the challenge with these three relationships. Because like mirrors, these three relationships, when we engage in them, they reflect things back to us that we may not want to see, but that we have to see. Because if we don't, we're going to continue to be blind. We're going to have these blind spots that are going to in, impact our relationships. And so we're going to walk through these three relationships. And under each one of these, I'm going to give you a practical step that you can do this week to start to become aware or to become more aware as you engage with these three mirrors, these three relationships. So write this down. The first relationship, the first mirror that reveals truth in our lives is relationship with God's word. It's relationship with God's word. I'm going to do my best not to blind anybody with this mirror. Uh, but relationship with God's word. And, and here's the deal. When it comes to God's word, I love this, this scripture right here. It's Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And the end of the verse says that the word of God judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. That the word of God judges us, the inside of us. It, it, it reflects to us what's going on in our lives and our heart and our relationships. And I want you to write down this simple phrase because it's really important. Write this down. Don't just read the Bible, but let the Bible read you. Don't just read the Bible, but let the Bible read you. Here's what I mean by that. As you encounter the Bible, it's not supposed to be a one-way street. When we read the Bible, it's not just, I want to read the Bible to learn about God. That's a very good thing. But we shouldn't just read the Bible for in information or inspiration, but we should read the Bible for transformation. It should be a two-way street where, where I look at the Bible and say, what does this say about God? And then I say, well, what does this say about me? What is this passage revealing about my heart, my day, my parenting, my relationship with my spouse, my attitude when I'm at work? What does God's word say and reflect back to me about who I am right now and what I need to be made aware of? And, and if you want to be brave this week and, and sit in front of the mirror of God's word, there are three passages that I would encourage you to dig into. And one of them is the book of Proverbs. If you sit and read the book of Proverbs, you're going to be confronted with all different kinds of truths and things where God can just shine this mirror on your life and say, hey, here's what I see. You do this. You don't do that. Hey, at work, you should be doing this. Proverbs is awesome for that. Uh, Galatians chapter 3 is another passage. Galatians 3 talks about the, the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. And as you read through Galatians 3, it's a great check on how am I doing in my walk with Jesus. And how am I really doing in my relationships? And the, the other one I love is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. It's the Sermon on the Mount. To, the greatest sermon ever told. And just to sit and read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and go, how am I doing? What does an accurate reflection of my life right now look like? In my marriage, in my parenting, in my friendships, at school, wherever I go, what does this mirror say about me? It's the mirror of the relationship with God's word. And it's so important. And if you sit in front of God's word, I promise you, as a two-way street and say, I'm going to let the Bible read me, you'll be shown all different kinds of things about your life. Things that you weren't aware of. Things that you need to be aware of. So mirror number one is the relationship with God's word. Now, I shave my head uh, because I'm balding. Uh, I'm 37 and balding, and I've got the little bird's nest thing back here now. It's great when my hair grows out. My sister makes fun of me mercilessly for that. Um, but I shave my head because it's cheap and it's free. And so I have to look into a mirror and shave my head like this. But there's a problem. I can't see behind me. I can't see the back of my head. And on more than one occasion, I've left a strip of hair back here somewhere and gone out in public and had the cashier at Hy-Vee say something like, Sir, you've got a, like, she was nice, even though I didn't do that to the bank teller. And I've had this big, and I'm like, how long have I been walking around with the, you know, one of these? So what I do now is I take a mirror in my bathroom and I look and I shave my head, but then I grab another mirror behind me and I hold it up and I do one of these. So then I can see behind me and God's word is awesome. God's word is great, but we need more than God's word to reflect who we are and to show us who we are. And so the second mirror that we have to hold up in our lives is this. It's relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
relationship with the Holy Spirit. And this mirror here represents the Holy Spirit in my life because this is my wife's mirror. And she sounds eerily like the Holy Spirit a lot in my life. And so this is the one I actually use when I shave my head, and this is my wife's mirror. But this represents relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I know some of you right now are going, okay, Holy Spirit, kind of vague, kind of Pentecostal. Like, what are we talking about? Listen, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the still, small voice of God inside of us. The Holy Spirit dwells and lives inside of believers, the Bible says. The Holy Spirit is our friend and our comforter and our encourager and our helper and our convictor. And if we sit with the Holy Spirit and have a relationship with him and invite him in, he speaks. I don't know how many times I've been convicted by the Holy Spirit. How many times I'll get that nudge during the day like, hey, you need to go confess sin to your wife. Yeah, I do. Hey, you need to, when you disciplined your son this morning, it was really harsh. You need to circle back and connect with your son this afternoon. Yep, I need to do that. Or, or how about this one that I get all the time? That joke you told was not funny. It was offensive. And you need to circle back and apologize. If we let the Holy Spirit speak... Over and over and over again, we will find ourselves before the mirror of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And God will say, hey, are you aware of this? We'll get those little nudges. That still small voice of God will speak and we'll go, yeah, I do that. Or I did that. Or that is there. And I do need to have that conversation. And here's a really simple thing you can do. It takes five minutes a day to do this. I want you to read this passage out loud as a prayer to God. It's Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. And I don't want you to turn there, but I want you to write it down. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. And I'm, I'm going to read it to you right now. Here's what it says. It says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If you sit with the Holy Spirit for five minutes a day and pray that prayer out loud to God and say, God, what do you see in me? God, where have you been near to me? God, where have I been far from you? God, what might I need to change in my life? And if you just take five minutes, it doesn't matter when, morning, noon, or night, and just sit and listen to what God will say, this mirror of the Holy Spirit will reflect things in your life that you weren't aware of. He'll reveal things to you that you need to see. And when I do this, I'm telling you, if if a minute goes by and something hasn't been spoken, I get a little antsy. But but it's like it doesn't take long to sit down, especially with my wife's mirror. (laughs) <laughs> and, and just allow the Holy Spirit to speak and say, hey, here's what you really have going on in your heart. Here's what's really going on in your marriage or your relationship with your kids or your friend or your coworker. It's not enough just to have one mirror in our lives. We have to have two so that we can hold this one up and then do one of these and see behind us. But there's also a third mirror. And the third mirror is this. I want you to write this down. The third mirror is relationship with people that we trust. Relationship with people that we trust. See, when we're, when we're trying to get rid of pride and deceit in our lives, we need these relationships, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, but also people that we trust. And here's something you've got to know. You have to have people in your life who you trust more than yourself. You have to have people in your life who you trust more than yourself. And some of you right now are going, but, but Pastor, I don't. And if you don't, that's a problem. Every single one of us needs people in our lives who say the hard things who come alongside of us and confront us when we're messing up. We need people in our lives to sit us down and say, hey, I think you're drinking too much. Or hey, I I just, the way you talk to your subordinate, that just seemed out of line and out of character for you. Or hey, I've noticed your wife is getting really, really bitter. What's going on in your relationship? We need people that ask us those questions and say those hard things to us. So here's what I want you to do this week. If you have those people in your life, great. I want you to do this with them. But if you don't, I want you to find two or three people. You don't have to have ten people in your life. But I want you to find two or three people that you trust. And I want you to sit them down. And I want you to give them permission to speak into your life. I want, them to say, I want you to say to them, hey, I trust you. I value your opinion. And I need you to say hard things to me. And begin to ask them these questions. What is it like to be on the other side of me? When you see me coming, how do you feel? What do you see in my Life And give them permission to do that repeatedly. I say, well, that's really uncomfortable and hard. Yeah, you bet it is. But guess what? Those people that you invite in are going to feel honored that you value them that much. And in my experience, when I ask people to do this in my life, they're ready for the challenge. They say, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. And a lot of times those people say, awesome, and would you do that for me? Because I need that too. 
We all need this mirror in our lives. We all need people to be invited in that can speak words of truth, hard things that we need to hear that say, hey, are you aware that you're doing this? We all need relationships, these three relationships with these three mirrors that reflect to us who we really are, that reveal blind spots in our lives. If we refuse to have relationships with people we trust, If we refuse to let the Holy Spirit speak to us and guide us, if we refuse to make the Bible the two-way street and let the Bible read us, we're going to end up with pride and deceit in our lives, and we're going to wind up in the ditch. But if we've got the courage to invite people in, if we've got the courage to sit with God's word, if we've got the courage to let the Holy Spirit say some of those hard things and nudge us in ways that we need to be nudged, we're going to be aware of things that we weren't aware of. And pride and deceit aren't going to have that grip on our lives anymore. And our relationships ultimately are going to be moved forward because we're going to be aware of things that God wants us to be aware of. And if you're going to change anything in your life or your relationships, the first step is to be aware of what we're not aware of. Hey, just a moment. We're going to walk through this experience. Jack's going to come back up and and we're going to close this five-week series down with this, this postcard and this exercise. But before we get there, let's say a quick word of prayer. God, we, uh, we know that so often in life, pride gets in the way. Lord, we think we've got it. We think we know. We think we're in control. God, we think we're good. And, and oftentimes we forget that we're not. And that's the beauty of you and the beauty of the gospel. That you free us from pride. That you free us from the deceit that we so often believe, God, when we hold on to lies about you or about ourselves. And Father, this week, help each and every one of us to sit with your word and ask those questions. What does it say about you and what does it say, God, about me? And help us to sit with Psalm 139 and just ask, God, that you would search us and know us. And that, God, you'd point things out to us. And that we would invite people into our lives that would keep us accountable and ask the hard questions and catch us when we fall. God, give us courage to do that. And as you reveal things in our lives, give us the grace we need to forgive ourselves and to move forward with courage. It's in Jesus' name we all pray together. Amen.